I want to begin today's khutbah with an acknowledgement. And that acknowledgement is that I cannot claim to understand what the young Muslims in Scotland go through. I haven't lived my life here. I've been working here for seven years, but I haven't lived my life here. And I don't truly understand the culture here. But Alhamdulillah, in the last seven years, I have worked with a lot of youth here. So I can say that I can understand a thing or two about what kind of challenges Muslim kids, Muslim youth face in the world nowadays. So inshallah, today's khutbah is from a universal perspective. And it will be based on my own experience, working experience with the young Muslim kids here for the last seven years. And I'm really hopeful that, inshallah, some of the things, some of the observations, some of the advices that I want to share with all of you, inshallah, you will find them beneficial. The first thing that I want to share with all of you is that, which is a very foundation, which is a very fundamental thing, and which is a foundation in every Muslim's life. And that is, and it's not only about the Muslim, young Muslim kids or young Muslim youth, it's also about us, the grown-up Muslims as well. The things nowadays, or things that are happening nowadays, I can say it with full confidence that if you ask an average Muslim youth, or if you ask an average Muslim kid, that beta, why are you Muslim? What's the reason? Why are you Muslim? Because majority of us, majority of us Muslims, we do not see Islam as a way to look at the world, as a way of life. We look at Islam as a religion, as a traditional thing that is passed down to me from my parents. So if you, if you ask an average Muslim youth or an average Muslim teen, beta, why are you Muslim? The most obvious answer, the most honest answer will be that I am Muslim because I was born in a Muslim family. Or I, was Mus I am Muslim because I live in a Muslim country. Or I was raised as a Muslim. These are the most honest and the most obvious answers you will get. And even if you find a student or a young person telling you that, you know, I'm a Muslim because I know Islam is the truth. Or I'm a Muslim because I know Islam is haq. Even though I should not judge that person and the intention of that person who is saying I'm Muslim because I know Islam is the truth. But the chances are he says this, the only reason he's saying this is because that's what you want him to say. But it's like what you expect, that's what you are expecting from him. That's what you would like to hear from him. He's saying this, but there is something, or this is something which is not based on sound and proper intellectual evidence or proof. And at the same time, you know, the world that we are living in nowadays, a lot of our young Muslim kids, they have a lot of questions about Islam. There are lots of things about Islam that they do not understand. There are lots of things about Islamic principles. There are lots of things about Islamic ethics. There are lots of things about Islamic law. There are lots of things about Muslim behaviors that they see around them. It's very disturbing to them. Very, very disturbing to them. And especially in our times when the questions about Islam and its validity and its integrity and its stability, you know, in the, in the, these questions are being asked in, in, in the circles, in the media circles in the West, you know, in literature, even the thinkers nowadays, thinkers in the Muslim world, you may find it amazing, or you may find it surprising, but thinkers in the Muslim world, they, they call themselves, you know, secular thinkers or progressive thinkers, but the thinkers in the Muslim world, they are questioning the very sanctity of Islam. They are asking these questions of why should we hold on to Islam? They are writers in Muslim world, and they are talking about how Islam is stopping us from making progress. Islam is the only thing that is holding us back. So in the middle of all of this, this generation, these young kids that are coming up, you cannot expect them not to be influenced by all of these things. Or some of these questions will never cross their mind. They will be affected by that. They will be affected by that. So this is the first thing, a very fundamental, and I know intellectual kind of thing, but this is a very basic and the first thing. Why are you Muslim to begin with? Why are you Muslim? What's the reason? And you know, we, a lot of us, we treat Islam as a traditional thing. So that was the first thing. The second thing is, what is your worldview? And I know I'm, I don't want to uh, make these terminologies too difficult for you to understand, so inshallah, I will make it easier for you. But what is your worldview? Meaning, what do you want from your life? 
What do you want most in your, in your life? What do you want out of your life? If you ask this question, if you ask an average Muslim youth or an average Muslim teen this question, chances are that their answers will not be very different from a Christian youth or from a Jewish youth or from a Hindu youth or even from an atheist youth who does not even have any faith. Their answers, Muslim kids' answers, will not be very different from their answers. Their answers will be, you know, I want to be a successful man, I want to have this career, I want to have this car, we all have our favorite cars, everyone has a favorite car, everyone has a favorite country that they want to move on, or whatever it is, but it's a handful of things and that's pretty much it. I want this from my life. So our life goals, the goals in our lives are not dictated, are not even influenced by this thing that we have inside of ourselves that we call Islam. Islam is not playing a major role in our outlook on life. So this was the second thing that I want to bring into your attention. The first thing is that we do not know why we are Muslim. The first thing is that we take Islam as a traditional thing. And the second thing is Islam is not influencing our outlook on life. The third thing that I want to share with all of you, by the way, all together there are four things. The third thing that I want to share with all of you is that a good number of young Muslim kids, a good number of Muslim youth, they don't see themselves as a part of something bigger. What I mean by that is that you can identify yourself with the college or with the university that you study in. You can identify yourself even, you know, with the city that you live in. You can even identify, nowadays, youth identify themselves with their favorite football team, if you know what I mean. You know, or at the most, a lot of youth, they are nationalist. They identify themselves with their country. And in some tribal areas of the world, people identify themselves with their families, with their tribe, with their race, but that's it. That's how they identify themselves. The primary mode of identification for a lot of Muslim youth, for a big numbers of Muslim, is not Islam anymore. That's not what they think when they identify themselves. And that's a problem. The first thing that comes in their mind, it's not that I'm a Muslim, and I have a solidarity with so many people all around the world who share the same kalima, la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah with me. This sense of identification, it has become weak. I'm not saying it's not there. It's there. But it has certainly become very, very, very weak. So when I identify myself, I identify myself, when I think about myself, I think about myself as a Pakistani first. I think about myself as a Punjabi first. I think about myself as an Arai first. One of these things first. And then the fact that I'm Muslim, it can be assumed because of my beard, because of my topi, because of my skin. It can be assumed. But this is not my primary mode of identification. So this was the third thing that I want to bring into your attention. The fourth thing, which is the most scary part of this conversation, is that a good number of Muslim, especially young Muslim, when Islam is presented to them, it is presented in a negative light. What I mean by that, some of our young Muslim kids, and I teach them, and I've been teaching them for the last seven years, they come from the families, even though they are coming to the masjid, by the way, but they come from the families that are not practicing families. As a matter of fact, practicing Islam is looked down upon in their family, like it is taken as a joke. And I'm not just talking about kids. I have met many people in my college days in Pakistan who came from the families. You know, they know about the prayers, so they pray once in a while. But if there is a woman in their family and she starts wearing hijab, or if there is a guy in their family and he has a beard, then the first thing that goes off in their mind is that this is an object of ridicule. It is something funny. This is something stupid. You know, this is something extreme. And this person, he cannot succeed in his life, that's why he's turning to religion. That's why he's becoming a Molvi, because he cannot succeed in his life. So sometimes you come from a family, and, and these are the assumptions, by the way, I'm not telling you something hypothetically, these are the assumptions of a lot of people. So sometimes you come from the family who look down upon religion. And sometimes people, they see Islam as a nuisance. They see Islam as a nuisance. They say, yeah, religion is good, but religion is good when you are in trouble. So for example, there are lots of kids sitting here, but for example, you know, if, if you do not study uh, for your finals this week, you will come to the mosque, you will pray five times daily prayer, 
you will make dua to Allah and then you come to Imam Sahib and you say to Imam Sahib, please make a dua for me, make dua for my exams, for my finals after the Jummah prayers, please. But Islam is for that. The religion is only when I'm in trouble. After that, religion is not for me. This is not something good. Because religion is, is a bunch of prohibitions and obligations. And they are a kind of a nuisance to me. Because, you know, it's always telling me, you have to do this, you have to, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to do that? Why everything is haram? I cannot do this, I cannot do that, I cannot do that. that to me, it feels like Islam is a bunch of restrictions. It, does, it, it keeps me from enjoying my life. It keeps me from living my life the way I want to live my life. So it's just a bunch of restrictions. Why should I follow this religion? So this is the view of religion that lots and lots and lots of our kids, that's how they view Islam. That's how they see Islam. And their view of Islam is not very different from other young people who follow other religion and how they view their religion. It's not very different from them. So these are the kind of perceptions that I want to bring into your attention that are universal perceptions. And I would think that this is a big challenge here in this community as well, when our kids come, as far as our kids are concerned. But at the same time, I'm not sure about that. So if you have any kind of feedback, you can come back to me after the Jummah prayers. But I, it, it is my uneducated assumption that these are the challenges that we are facing here. Or at least some of the things that I have raised, you may be able to identify with them. Or some of these concerns resonate with you. Or you can think of people that these concerns, these concerns resonate with. So now what should we do about these problems? I've mentioned four problems. So what should we do about these problems? Let's start from the top. You know, I personally believe, because I've been a teacher here for seven years, and like I said before, if you have any kind of disagreement with me, you can come to me and talk to me afterwards. But I personally believe the first and foremost thing that we should do for ourselves and for our kids is that we have to reconstruct their mentality. We have to reconstruct the idea that Islam is a source of pride. Islam is something that gives us strength. Islam is what made us a noble civilization. If you look at our history, Islam is what that made us know about civilization. Islam is what that held us in high esteem. We have something to offer to the world. The entire world is looking up to us because we have something to offer to them. This is the mentality that we need to bring back. We need to bring it back into the minds of our young Muslim kids. And you know, no matter through all this garbage and all the rubbish and all the poison that you might hear on your TV, on Fox News, or on BBC, you cannot lose the sight of the fact that Islam is the religion of the truth and it's a superior way of living your life. Every other way of living your life, you should feel sorry for that. Unfortunately, what is happening with our kids is that instead of following Islam, we are imitating people that we are not supposed to imitate. And these people don't deserve to be imitated. For example, Please excuse me if I'm a little frank here. But for example, Justin Bieber is a big, th big thing here. It's a big thing here. One Direction, the boys of One Direction, they are a big thing here. And our kids follow them fanatically. They idealize them, they follow them. They have their book bags, they follow their videos, they follow their concerts, they follow them on Instagram, Twitter, they want to live their life, they are doing whatever they can to follow that person. They are huge fans of them. And you guys know this better than I do, that these guys are caught using drugs. These guys are caught doing these indecent things that I cannot even mention here. Doing indecent things in public places, and they were recorded. They were caught on cameras. Still, our kids idealize them. Unfortunately, we have these role models who don't deserve to be our role models, but we have made them this way. And you tell me, what should I expect from you? And how far do you expect you can go in your life if your role models are this pathetic? How far can you go in your life? So the first and foremost thing that we have to do for our kids is to revive this idea that Islam is a source of pride. Islam is something that gives us strength. Because of Islam, we can offer something good to the world. That's the first thing. The second thing that comes with that is that, and I'm going to say to everyone here, it's not just for the kids. Please stop treating yourself like kids. And I'm talking to the grown-ups here as well. Start taking the responsibility. You know, as far as our religion is concerned, as far as our way of life is concerned, as far as our Islam is concerned, pretty much when you are a teen, you should act like an adult now. You will be treated like an adult. Let me ask you this simple question. Salah becomes first upon you when how many years old? How many years old? 10 years old. Salah become further upon you. 
Fasting becomes further upon you when how many years old? 12 years old. Even before you become teen, these things are becoming further upon you, obligation upon you. Means what? You need to take responsibility now because you are becoming a role model. You are becoming a role model for the younger kids in your family. So if you are living a life of recklessness and you don't care about the consequences of your action, and even in the domestic things, you don't show respect to your parents, you don't pray five times a day, and you talk back to your parents, and you are a role model, you should know that you are a role model. There are kids in your family, your younger siblings, there are kids in your neighborhood who look up to you, who want to become like you. You are a role model to them, so when you do that, you leave this kind of legacy behind for them to follow. Because believe it or not, there are kids in your community, there are kids in your family who look up to you, who want to become like you. You are a role model to them. So whatever you do, leaves a legacy behind. So if you follow this miserable kind of lifestyle, and you don't care about the consequences of your action, and this is the legacy that you're leaving behind for the kids to follow, for your own kids or for the other kids to follow, for your younger siblings to follow. If you have any ounce of belief in the day of judgment, on the day of judgment, you will be standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, answering questions on their behalf as well. It's not just that you have to answer for your own parting, you have to answer for these kids as well, because this is the legacy that you left behind. You have to answer for those questions. And I'm not just saying that this is not my opinion. Allah tells us in the Quran, They will be carrying their burdens and a burden on top of them. Why? Because they were bad influences. And a lot of time for young people, other young people are worst influence. Young people don't look up to the old people to find their ways. Even I'm feeling a senior citizen while talking to you about these things. You, among you, you are each other's role model. You are each other's major influences. And if you look into the Quran, you will find this idea. There's five minutes left, but I need your attention now. In the Quran, you will find this idea. Allah is talking about these people who want to make young Sahaba, young Muslims, kuffar again, disbelievers again. So they go up to them and they say to them, Ittabi'u sabilana, follow our path, follow our way of life, wal khatayakum, and we will carry your sins on the day of judgment. Don't worry. Don't worry about your sins, don't worry about your khataya, we will carry your khataya, we will carry your sins on the day of judgment. Don't worry about that. And Allah told them, They are not going to be carrying your sins. They are liars, don't fall into their trap. Don't fall into their trap. Don't be a trendsetter of evil. Don't be a follower, become a leader. You guys need to become a leader. You have to take the responsibility. That's why confidence in Islam plays such a major role. And you know, if sisters are listening to me, in my humble opinion, one of the major crises that we are facing in the Muslim Ummah today is the confidence of a Muslim woman. A Muslim woman needs to take pride in the fact that she is a Muslim. She needs to take pride in the fact that she wears hijab. She needs to take pride in the fact that she is practicing Islam. You know, when that pride is not, there, is not there, then they are looking for validation in other things. And as far as we are concerned, we men are concerned, in our family, our fathers need to give confidence to our daughters. Our husbands need to empower our wives. This culture needs to change. You know, a lot of time, unfortunately, when we think about Islam, we think about women being oppressed. We think about their voices being suppressed. But that was not the situation in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa In the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa women spoke. Sahabiyat spoke. Dr. Akram Nadwi, rahmatullah, Dr. Akram Nadwi, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him abundantly, he wrote a book, as Sahabiyat, the female scholars of Islam. Go and check that book. One third of your religion is coming from whom? Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Women were educated people. They were the teachers of the community. They were in those responsible positions. They were heard. We need to change that culture. We need to give this confidence to our women. And our women need to revive this culture. Our women need to revive this confidence in Islam. The final thing that I want to share with you, I only have three minutes left. So the final thing that I want to share with all of you is that, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, we have to raise above then our pity goals in life. We have to look at all those people whom Allah has not given this gift of la ilaha illallah. This great, great gift, this great thing that Allah has given you and me, this noble thing that Allah has given you and me. You know, we should look at all those millions and billions of people Allah has not given them this gift of la ilaha illallah and we should feel sorry for them. But you know what? I feel sorry for the person whom Allah has given this gift la ilaha illallah and he still does not appreciate what it is. He doesn't appreciate you know, just imagine you have been given a really expensive gift, like, uh, I don't know, what is the latest BMW series? Seven? Eight? 
what is it, whatever it is. Like you have been given a BMW latest series and you don't appreciate it. You don't get an expensive gift and throw it away in the bin. You don't do that, you value that gift. You try to appreciate what it is. I personally believe that we Muslims who are born in Muslim families, who are raised in Muslim families, we do not appreciate what Islam is. We don't. We were born in Muslim family, we saw Islam all around us. There is a masjid, alhamdulillah, that we come to every Friday, even though there are all kinds of dramas going on in the masjid, but still it's a masjid. We hear azan here, the azan is common here. That's not like this for everyone. I can tell you, I have friends who were Jews, Christian, atheists. When they became Muslim, their entire family kicked them out of their houses. They abandoned them. I met a boy in Dundee seven years ago, a Romanian guy. He was a son of a minister. He was a son of a Christian minister. He saw Kaaba in his dream, became a Muslim. Started practicing Islam in his whole neighborhood. He's the only white guy practicing Islam. His father was the minister of religion. He said to him, you're worshiping idol, you're worshiping devil. You are possessed by devil. He kicked him out of his house, but he still held on to Islam. People sacrifice for Islam. And we think it's just a bunch of annoying rules. It's just of some things that don't make any sense. If you think that Islam don't make any sense, I can challenge you. I can challenge you that you haven't spent your time, you haven't spent your life understanding Islam, or you haven't gone to the right people to ask about Islam. I would actually argue the foundation is not there. The foundation is not there. The foundation that should build absolute certainty that Islam is the truth. The foundation that should give you this unshattering conviction that Islam is the truth. That foundation is not there. That foundation needs to be there. You kids, you young Muslim kids, you are the future of this ummah. You need to carry this responsibility. If you don't carry this responsibility, then this ayah of the Quran, the scary ayah of the Quran can become true. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In yakunu If you turn away from me, I will replace you with another nation. I don't need you. If you don't, if you turn away from me, if you don't turn to me and turn away from me, I will replace you with another nation. And then Allah said, Summa la yakunu amsalakum. They won't be like you. They will be better than you. They won't be like you. My request to all the kids, all the adults, all the brothers and sisters who are listening to me right now. You at least have the responsibility. Look, we are living in 21st century. This is a century of information. Everything is on your fingertip now. You at least have the obligation to understand why Allah has given you this kalima, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasul. Not to cut corners, not to tell other people that I am better than you. And I am on haq and you are on batil and I am going to Jannah, you are going to Jahannam and my Eid is right and your Eid is wrong. Not for that reason, not for these petty reasons. Try to learn the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for yourself. Try to find your purpose in life. Why Allah has given me this kalima? Why I'm still alive? Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put me on this world? And then make a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Ya Allah, how can I become a service to your deen? How can I leave a good legacy behind? How can I leave a good mark behind? Then whether you are in the field of medicine or engineering, Allah will open doors for you. You don't have to become an alim and a scholar of Islam to talk, talk about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to do something for the deen of Allah. These fields are not irreligious field, but if you are in one of those fields, then be the best in it. Be the best. That Islam wants from you. If you are a programmer, don't be a dirty programmer with a dirty code. If you are in medicine, be the best in your class. And I'm not talking about from worldly point of view, I'm talking about from religious point of view. You know, a lot of you people, mashallah, you have businesses. Be a business reformer. Introduce business ethics in your business and you never know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use your reforms for the rest of the world. You never know. Think big. Leave a legacy behind. Leave a mark behind. And inshallah when you do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring change in our community. We all have to raise above our pity goals in life and we have to think big. So I sincerely make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us united in this dunya. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reunite us in the hereafter. Wa akhudawana alhamdulillah.